guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It's nine o'clock. It's time for a magic, uh, a talk magic. And today I am here with a legend of the British magic community, not just the British magic community, but the worldwide community. Someone I have had so much respect for, a creator, a performer, an innovator, and an all round nice guy. Of course, it is the one and only John Allen. Hey, John, how you doing, mate? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm excited to have you on the channel. I really am because I've wanted you on here for a while. You know, I'm a big fan of your material. You know, I talk about it on the channel all the time. You're one of the people that has been most requested on this channel. People keep saying to me, when are you going to interview John Allen? And I know you're so busy. So all of those things coupled together, I just want to say a big thank you. No, my, my pleasure. I can just about fit you into my hectic schedule. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm, it's getting busy we talked off camera about how it's it's opening up and things are getting a lot busier so um you know but not not just for you and me but for everyone things seem to be you know opening back up which is which is good and I'm sure we you know we can talk about this in the future but uh yeah. in, in the interview but what I want to do in this interview is I want to talk to you about everything I've got so many questions you you have accomplished so much in your career and there's so much that you've done in so many different fields of magic that um, it's going to be really fascinating kind of finding out more about you and about your journey so yeah I want to ask you lots of questions well let's kick off this seven hour question-a-thon well, you know what? As I said, the, uh, the, the the longest interview on this channel is is held currently by Sean Farquhar. Oh, that that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I, I can. <laughs> I love I, you, Sean. Couldn't stop him. Couldn't stop. He kept going and going and going. So I don't think anyone's going to touch him. But uh, we'll see what we can do. Now, I want to uh, I want to start off at the very beginning because I can't imagine that many people don't know who you are, but. Hmm. No, I'm pretty sure most people do. I mean, when you get into magic very early on, there's certain people whose names pop up. In the UK, you are like at the pinnacle as a performer. You're very in demand. You're the person that is operating at a very high level, along with a few other people. But also as a creator, everybody knows who you are. Some of the some of the tricks that you've innovated and created and marketed and published are some of the most well-known, well-used tricks in magic. So a lot of people will know who you are, but for those that don't, maybe they're new into magic, let's find out a little bit more about you, John. So okay. let's start off at the very beginning and, and find out about your origin story and how you got into magic. So what was it that, that, that caused you to, you know, eventually become who you are right now? Well, I have an exciting origin story like nobody else because when i was about nine years old i was given a book of magic that's See, unique no one else no one else has ever had that story have they never so, heard of yeah before. although i think mine mine was i just remember I, I may actually have it in the garage somewhere it's a little black book i think it was blackstone's little book of magic mm. uh, so it was all fairly fairly simple so i was i was given that when i was about nine years old and that Kind of sparked my interest but I'd, I'd always been sort of an, an inquisitive kind of child and I wanted to know you know what why, why doesn't the moon fall out of the sky and and how does the television work and how I was always asking these 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 searching questions uh, and I think magic has that you know how does it work you know we, we all start with that when we, when we start um, so that, that was the book, and, and I think I got a, a little magic set when I was uh, for, for my birthday. And at the time, uh, Paul Daniels was was on the TV, and he had a range of magic. And I do remember cycling to the toy shop to buy. I think it was the the light blue was the easy. Working up to I think it was purple or black was the most difficult. So I, I, you know, I, I wanted to, 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 to learn more magic and, and buy more tricks. And at the time it was kind of just doing the magic tricks. Mm -hmm. So I had that. Um, and then I was doing a, f a, a few little shows for like family, friends, but they, that was always the, oh, isn't he wonderful sort of thing as, as, as children get, no matter how bad they are. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was kind of my, my very very early start but then of course with Paul Daniels being on TV 
and no matter what anyone else thinks, he was a remarkable performer, uh, not just on TV, but, but live as well. So to have him on TV, I think it was 17 years in a row on a Saturday night, I don't think anyone else is ever going to come close to that uh, because it was him. It was his show. It's not he's a presenter for a TV show. So I could watch him and, and that would uh, increase my, uh, my love of magic, I guess. And then luckily, I knew people who kind of knew people that worked on the show. So I was lucky enough rather than sort of socializing on a Saturday, I would go with, I guess, with magician friends and we go and watch the filming of the shows and go to the green room. And it was just, it was just a wonderful uh, education as well. Um, so that was, that was my teenage years. And then with regards taking that bigger leap, I think that came um, after I finished Polytechnic which for the younger people, you can look that up on the internet. Uh, my last night at Polytechnic, we went out to a restaurant and there was a magician there. And I don't really remember too much. I just remember he was doing something with a change bag in the restaurant. And I thought, I'm pretty sure I can do this. If that's what he's doing working, then I can probably do this as well. So I found out that, um, yeah, I found out how he, he approached restaurants. There were a few restaurants in the same chain near to where I live. So I went to one of them, asked them if I could sort of, you know, uh, do some magic. And, they, and the girl there went to see the manager. The manager came out and she went, sorry, you want to do what? Because performing magic in restaurants was this, you know, it, it hadn't really taken off at all. And then she just hadn't got the faintest idea how that would work. But there was one restaurant that gave it, said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do it maybe for a couple of hours on a Sunday. So that got my foot in the door uh, to performing. It wasn't really like big money, but I, I was performing. Um, and so, yeah, so that, uh, that kind of got me started on the road. And, and while you were, and what age were you when you were going and working in restaurants? Was it when you were younger or, or was it? later on later on yeah it was it was late teens is when i when i got in got uh, working into the restaurant and then i was actually lucky enough to get a second restaurant uh job in london as well okay. so i was working two restaurants a week and it, it was just great and were you were you doing something else alongside that as well so did you have a job that you were doing alongside that well yeah uh, my parents as as parents do wanted me to get a proper job and uh, so I got a job working in an accounts office. Okay. Uh, highly, highly exciting. Um, I had always wanted to do something creative. I, I've always been interested in maths and numbers. So uh, there was accountancy. I'd looked into uh, architecture, wanted to be an architect. Um, and so the, the lots of A's. I didn't get to barrister or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I did, I did accountancy for, for six months. But then I had the opportunity to do uh, Camp America, uh, which I don't know if you've done. I, I did Camp America. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's amazing. So it, it's just so much fun. And I recommend that to, to everybody as well. So I had the opportunity to do that for a month, but I couldn't keep my job. But I thought I'm going to go the fun route. You know, the, the accountancy work it wasn't really exciting for me. So I went off to do that. It came back, didn't have a job, but still had the restaurant. So I was earning a little bit of money. And then one day, whether it was fate or whatever, uh, there was a guy in the restaurant on a Sunday afternoon who knew a little bit about magic called Marvin Burglass. And he uh, gave me his card, told him to get in touch about working for Marvin's Magic. So I did that for, I think, a couple of years working in Hamleys and Harrods. So, yeah, it, it was pretty much after I was like 20 years old um yeah just doing just doing magic it was, it was great and then off the back of doing marvin's magic which we'll talk about in a second but off the back of doing that did you start to try and get gigs outside of marvin's and that eventually led to you becoming full-time yeah I mean, the, the restaurants is, is a great place i always saw it as i'm every time i perform for people i'm auditioning mm. so it was just a way of of, of auditioning for, for people uh, but then 
it was, I can't remember how old I was, maybe 20, 21, something like that. I discovered Davenport's. Mm. Uh, and it's like, you know, it was just this, th there weren't these sort of lights coming off it and the ah sort of thing, you know, it's like, oh my God. But th there it is with a few tramps and, you know, <laughs> whatever outside. Um, so I went in and I, I joined the, uh, the Demon Club there. And from that, it was joined, uh, there was the Magic Circle. And that's when I started to, to get gigs after I met, you know, the, the, the magicians at the Magic Circle. Okay. Okay. So I've got a few questions. I suppose the first question is, how important would you say for somebody who's wanting to become a better magician, how is important is flight time? Because listening to you, you were going through a period of time where you're working in Marvin's magic, which for anybody who demonstrates magic, they will tell you, you have to get very good very quickly, else you're not going to sell anything. You've not just yeah. got to win people over. You've also got to win them over to the point that they're prepared to part money. And it, it's immaterial what sort of magic you're performing it's about building up that connection with people. But then you're working restaurants as well and you're going and working in different material in different restaurants. You're out working all the time, which kind of explains to me why you became so good so quickly. Would you say that's important? It, it is important, uh, absolutely. Uh, this flight time, performance time, it, you, you can only get better. You know, you, you, you will make mistakes. And for me, I've never really been one to sort of practice at home, practice in front of the mirror. I really don't think that helps. You, you've got to learn the basics, but then just go out and do it because that's where you will learn how to perform in front of people. If you learn how to perform in front of a mirror or on your own in silence with no distractions, when it comes time to performing in front of people at different angles with lots of distractions, you're not going to be prepared. So I would always use those times to, to practice the, the magic. You, you've still got to learn the fundamentals and the basics of timing and understand things like misdirection and uh, you know, um, energy and relaxation. But you've, you can only do it properly when you're out working so yeah when you're starting out just try and um, do magic for you know anywhere you know if you can do it for free I, you know i don't want to get onto the should you ever work for free sort of thing but when you're first starting out any any time you can you can perform for people um is is going to be helpful it, it really will will do a world of good mm. Completely agree with you, 100%. And, and obviously, you eventually made the decision to go full time. That's a question I get on this channel all the time. There's so many magicians that will ask me the same question. When do I go full time? I want to be a full time magician. I hate my job. Should I quit my job? And it's very difficult to answer because it's so individual. But somebody who you know, went from having a job to eventually becoming a full time magician, is there any advice that you can offer on that subject? Of, of when to, when to, when sort to of yeah, like, make the decision. Exactly. When, you know, what needs to happen in order for somebody to become a full-time magician? Well, I, I think you've got, well, the, the, a deeper meaningful answer, and I, I give this to people when they say, why did you choose to become a magician? I say, I didn't choose magic. Magic chose me. In the same, Harry Potter did not choose his wand. The wand chose Harry Potter. So it's kind of one of those things. I didn't choose to be a magician. This is what I meant to do. You know, you get actors that get asked that, you know, what would you do if you weren't an actor? Well, it's a redundant question because this is what I am. So, you know, I, I think for me, I was always destined to be a magician. But I do think that, you know, if taking the, the, the non-deeper meaningful answer, you, you do have to have a passion for magic, for performance, for entertaining people, and you've got to be a people person. Uh, I know there's a, a lot of uh, performers, like com especially comedians, you always hear about comedians are very sad, maybe depressive people, except when they're in the limelight. And 
you get a lot of that with performers. And I think magicians can be the same. But for me, I just I just love it. And I think if you're going to if you're going to uh, make a career of it, then you have to let that shine through. If you're forcing yourself because you go, oh, my God, I can earn a lot of money doing magic tricks for people. You're not going to last very long because it, your, your real self and, and your true nature will show through. So I think if you're going to make the leap, whatever age it might be, uh, you, you've got to show that passion. I think people who maybe do another job and then fall into magic or they go, oh, I'm just going to do, you know, I, I used to be a teacher or something like that. No offense to teachers. But, you know, I, I've had a whole career doing something else and now I'm going to be uh, a magician. There will be exceptions to the rule, but I think that's going to be a lot, a lot harder than if you, you know, you start off and, you know, th this is what you really, really want to do. I agree. And one thing that I've noticed about you in all the years that I've, I've known you is that does come across your passion and your love for magic comes across. And I've seen magicians in the past and it almost feels full time magicians and they feel like they you can just tell that they've lost their love for it and they're going through the motions and they're normally the ones that don't stick around. And you, you are 100 percent correct. I mean, I've, I've never thought of it that way, but you're you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. When I was I was uh, uh, talked to a, a friend once who uh, asked, how can I just do the same few tricks for people? You know, uh, I think it was Michael Skinner who would never repeat a trick throughout a whole event. You know, but for me, uh, if you take a, an example of like the ambitious card, you know, you do the same things all the time. Don't you ever get bored? And I go, well, no, because I'm dealing with different people doesn't matter about the trick being the same i'm dealing with people who've never seen it their reactions are going to be different and the way that i perform it means that it's going to be different every time so for, for me i i can do the same trick because it's the reactions and the connection and the rapport that i have with the people i'm doing it for and that the magic allows me to have with them that's the most important thing mm. not the trick Perfect. Let me um, ask you one more question. What we've talked about up until this point is exclusively close-up magic. Yeah. Um, but you're known as much of a, these days, you're known as much of a stage performer as you are a close-up magician. I mean, the pain game is a perfect example of a, probably one of the most perfect stage tricks that there is. And silent treatments, and we'll get onto that in a bit. But did you... Did, did did you focus on close up magic, and when was it that you decided you 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 wanted to experience stage magic as well? And I suppose another question with regards to all of that is, did you ever have a desire to do kids magic? Because um, I can't imagine you as a kids performer, but I speak to a lot of people who, when they first started, they'd go out and do kids shows to make ends meet until the other work. Yeah, uh, I mean, when when I was when I was a teenager doing some magic tricks and I, I did some, some little shows for uh, friends, family, you know, um, there was, there was a, a, a girl and it was her birthday party. Uh, so they, you know, they were, they were friends of our family. So I, I did some magic there. Uh, that that's where I learned that you shouldn't do a brainwave deck in front of uh, French windows at nighttime. Uh, <laughs> mirrors aren't good. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I did kids. I, I don't like doing uh, children's shows. Mm -hmm. I, I have great respect for any person that can do children's shows. I, I say it's, you know, close up and children's shows or, or corporate and children's shows. There's not actually not much difference between corporate shows and children's shows. But I say it's a bit like dentistry and brain surgery. You know, it's all part of the same head, but it's completely different skills. Mm. So the skills needed to entertain children are different to those needed to entertain adults as well, mm. you know. Um, so I've never really looked into do it, doing kids. It's just a completely different skill set. Mm. Um, and what was, the what was the first question? It was about, oh, close hey, up. When did, when did you find, yeah, because for the people that are watching this, when, when you maybe first got into magic, you alluded to this earlier yeah. on, Close-up magic wasn't really a thing like it is now, was it? I mean, it... it well, was. I don't think it was a... Th I, I mean, close-up magic 
it's always been around, but the concept of doing it in a restaurant mm -hmm. environment was was unheard of in a way. Um, and, and also, yeah, may, maybe at events, uh, you know, there were obviously shows, but yeah, to do it at events, I think, yeah, like in the 80s into the 90s. But yeah, close up, I think a lot of people get into close up first because they go, so I, so you're telling me I can do magic with rubber bands and coins and a pack of cards. But if I want to do stage illusions, it's a thousand pounds for this. It's 2000 pounds for that. It's even 500 pounds. Which one am I going to choose? So I think that's why a lot of people do, do close up. Uh, and, but then it is, it's, it is just a natural progression, I think. I mean, I've never been, I've never done illusions, never, never gone that far, but to do stand-up magic and, and to just make the magic a little bit bigger, um, yeah, I, I think it's just a, a natural progression from doing close-up when people say, could you entertain 50 people at a time, 100 people at a time? Yeah, and, and that also has, is problem-solving as well a little bit. Which, which is something else I, I really enjoy doing. It, you know, how can you do a stand-up show for 50 people for half an hour, you know, without spending a fortune on, on magic props? And how do you deal with nerves? Because one of the things that comes up again on this channel over and over again is people that are going on stage, magicians that want to perform on stage, that are close-up performers primarily, and the thought of going and standing up in front of 50 people scares them to death because it is so far removed from three or four people standing around at an event to walking out cold on stage. Nobody knows who you are and having to get everyone's attention. And that's the thing that causes nerves with a lot of people. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think it was Jerry Seinfeld who said that the, the number one thing that people fear is public speaking. And number two is death. So that it means that if, if, if you go to a funeral, you'd prefer to be in the coffin than give the eulogy. Mm. So, yeah, public, public speaking, being on stage is pretty nerve wracking. Uh, I think it was Paul Daniels who said, you know, if you're nervous, it means you're not prepared. Mm. But I, I think being nervous is a good thing because it, it means that you care about doing the best job you can. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm terrible before I, I go on stage. Uh, I, I really am. Um, but once, once you're on stage, you know, it, it, it's fine. It, it really is fine. So I think it is okay to be nervous. I think not, not to the point where it overtakes you, but I, I do genuinely say, as I said, if, if you have nerves, it, it's not so much for me, I, I might do something wrong or they might see how it works. It's, it's just that it is just that not knowing. And, and also, I can't do anything about it. Once I'm on stage, I can do something about it. I can I find out about the audience, you know, very quickly. I think it's important to find out what the audience is like, whether you've got them eating out of the palm of your hand straight away or whether they need a little bit of work but all of that is unknown when you're waiting to go on so for me that's that's what the nerves are about that's, that's great advice that really is talking about nerves another question i want to ask you is obviously we've got to the point of your career now where you've gone full time you're you're generating a decent amount of work at some point you decide to start entering competitions and obviously we know You've, you've won some quite high profile competitions over the years. What was your reasoning behind entering a competition? Was it a desire to prove yourself to your peers? Was it a desire to have social proof that you could use to market yourself? Uh, what, 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 because a lot of people, again, I see questions on this channel all the time and people say, should I enter a competition? What's the purpose? What's the need? So as somebody who's entered and won at a very high level, yeah. what was your reasoning? Well, I, I had uh, been to a few conventions in America, the IBM especially, and it was 1994 uh, that I was at the IBM and I saw Steve Bedwell. Uh, he won the, the IBM close-up. Sorry? Walkman Act. Uh, yes, yes. 
and so he he'd won and again I, I i looked at the i looked at that and i thought you know i i think i can do this you know i i it, it's always you know co compare you know, it's not that like you're comparing to other people but you just look at at what people are doing and think i i I'm I'm at that standard at least, and I, I think it would be good. So I didn't really enter to raise my profile or as a stepping stone to other things. It was it was kind of to to prove for myself. Uh, I had entered. I was trying to think of the timeline now because I'd, I'd entered Ron McMillan's as well, um, and I think I got a I, I got a commendation. So I was in the top six but i'm still an award-winning magician you know we, we use that um so i think that was the, the precursor or i may have actually wanted to do that after i'd seen I, i'd gone to the ibm i can't exactly remember the timeline but it was that competition in 94 and i thought you know what i, I think i can do this and i'll set myself a target for doing it next year uh, because I, I wanted to go to the IBM conventions anyway, so if I can enter the competitions as well, you know, I I, I can see if I could do it. So again, it, it's really proving proving to myself, am I am I a good magician? And so yeah, ninety five in Oakland, California, and um, yeah, I was I was lucky enough to win. It was it was great. Uh, I did have the the luxury of um, I, I'd met Dan Harlan that year. And I stayed with him before the IBM in 95. And he was able to help with the act uh, and just tighten things up. Um, so he helped as well. But yeah, 95 was, was the turning point. And as I said, it was just, what level am I at? Mm. But from that, things did, did snowball. Uh, as to whether you should enter a competition, uh, again, it, it depends, you know, what, what are you trying to prove? Um, because you, you can win a competition and be a, a, an award-winning magician, which, which is fine. Um, but I think, you know, what, what, what are you going to do with it? Are you, are you trying to prove to yourself what level you're at? Are you trying to prove that you, you know, you can work on an act? Because that's what I think a lot of people want to do now is have an act. Um, the one thing I, I had said about competition is it is good for timing because you might get eight minutes. If you do eight minutes and one second, you are disqualified. Mm -hmm. So if you're going on TV, let's say you're doing live TV and you have a four minute spot, they will not give you four minutes and 10 seconds. They will give you four minutes. So I think competitions are good for uh, a more structured performance. So, yeah, there, there are a few different reasons as, as to why someone may want to enter a competition. And I suppose the biggest question is, if somebody's watching this and they are wanting to enter a competition, they think they're good enough. There's two schools of thought, and I'd love to know what you think. Um, some people say you should just do what you do. You should take your commercial acts that you work in gigs or whatever it may be and just do that because that's what you're comfortable with. Whilst there's other people that say you need to create an act specifically for a competition because it needs to be different and it needs to have sort of a different criteria than what you would do at your average corporate gig. Um, yeah. what, what would you say is the, the best approach with that? Well, I think you need to look at maybe what people have done in the competition before what sort of acts have won in the past but also and, and i had this with the magic circle is what are the judges looking for what is the criteria because you'll get people you'll, you'll get competitions where they've got lay judges and magician judges which i think is a terrible idea it's an awful awful idea because are, you know, the, the magicians may say, or what, sorry, the, the, the lay person may say, that was absolutely fantastic. I, I've got him as number one. By far and away, he was the best magician there. And the magic judges are going, well, that was Albert Goshman's act, word for word, move for move. Mm. So what's the point of having lay judges if, if, you're, you know, if the magician judges are going to mark you down? 
But likewise, you can do uh, an act, as you said, you know, your everyday act, uh, your commercial act. But the ma magicians much prefer the magician who was original, you know, magic moves and, and all that sort of stuff. Whereas the lay person much prefer your commercial act. So you've got to find out, you, you can't just say we're looking for the best magician. That, that's what is the best magician that there isn't one so if you're if you are entering a competition find out what the criteria is for winning it and and go from there that's great that's fantastic really great advice now another another question that i want to ask you so we've got to a point in your career now where you're a full-time pro you've entered and won competitions your profile's gone up you're getting a higher quality of work and obviously as we all know you you operate now at a very high level um but at some point during that journey, you decided to start creating magic. And from memory, and I've done no research about this, so I apologize. Okay. Your first DVD, was, your first product or anything with spectators don't exist. Uh, that was my first product. That was my first video. Right. Okay. First video. Was that the first thing that you kind of offered out? No, my, the first thing um, we have... We, we always hear stories of independent creations. And I have what I believe is the greatest independent creation story of all time ever. Am I building this up too much? I'm, I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat, I really am. <laughs> I, I had come up with an idea and I, I got framed with a, a, a magician called Danny Archer, who, who's a, a, a great magician, really lovely guy. And I phoned him up. I, I wasn't really sure. I didn't know about Murphy's Magic or, or any, anything else like that. I didn't know what to do. I had an idea. Um, and so I phoned up Danny in America and I gave him this idea. Well, I, I wasn't too sure I should tell him too much or, you know, a little bit wary. I, I don't know why. But he said, go on, just, just tell me what the idea is. So I said, well, the idea is that you have 10 cards and each of them have got a phobia written on them in the style of the phobia. And you would mix them up. Someone would choose one. And in this case, it was legyrophobia, which is the fear of loud noises. Inside the little plastic wallet, there's a prediction. They take out the prediction and there's a bang gimmick on it. So it would just go bang not the greatest trick maybe but no, it was great. it was the start it was a start and he listened to it and he said i don't believe what i've just heard he said i got a call 45 minutes ago from a friend of mine who happens to be a teacher in midwest america so danny said he called me 45 minutes ago telling me about an idea he's had he said, the idea is that there's 10 cards and they've all got phobias written on them, the little pictures of the phobia. And someone chooses one and it's a fear of snakes. And inside the uh, little packet, there's a, a prediction. You open it up and it's the rattle gimmick. It's like, I'm sorry. So not only has someone come up with the same trick essentially we have both called the same person 45 minutes apart that's crazy it was unbelievable so uh I, I just hadn't got a clue what to do um but as it happens we we both released them i mean they were both called phobia what else are you going to call it a trick about phobias and so that was that that was that was the start, really. So that was my that was my first product, and uh, yeah, you know, Murphy's Murphy's took it on, and and kudos to them. They said that they would buy it even if it was on it, it was on my computer still. I was still designing the cards, and they said, "Yeah, we we like the idea. We'll we'll take it from you." So you know, I did have the <clears throat> sorry, I, I did have the advantage, I guess, of being the IBM close-up champion. So, you know, are competitions any good? They do help a little bit. They so, yeah, that, that was my first, that was my very first product, and, and that was the story behind it. 
So what made you, before we go on about other products, what made you decide to start creating magic? Because you've, you've like you say, you've won, you've won the IBM, you've uh, got a very successful career, you're not having to worry about gigs, uh, your, your fees are going up, the amount of clients that you've got are going up. It's not like you needed the money, oh, I want to sell this trick so I can pay the rent this month. That wasn't the case. What was the reason behind the desire to actually start releasing magic? Honest answer is, I do not know. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, but I remember from, from, the, I, uh, from the IBM Act, um, it was also the IBM, uh, the, the British IBM as well. I, I did cigarette in jacket. So everyone, I, I, was, I borrowed a jacket and I did the, the, the usual thing. And then I pulled a two foot long cigarette from out of the jacket. <laughs> so that, that was kind of my opener. And uh, maybe it was discussing with, with Dan, but the idea about um, producing this, the big SIG, as I called it. Um, and so I think it was taking advantage of the act to maybe, you know, uh, sell some things to magicians. So that possibly sparked the idea that, you know, maybe I could sell some things. Um, but I think, it, I think it is just... The, the advancement of you start off by you know reading tricks doing the tricks copying tricks but then I, I always equate it with music is you start learning the notes and, and rhythm and harmonies and you can create your own music yeah. and that works with magic as well is is you can slowly develop your own magic tricks and you realize well actually there is something to sell. It's not an idea. There is a, an actual physical product. And yeah, I, I can make some money. I mean, I was never a, you know, I'm so wealthy. I don't need any more. Just call me Jeff, you know? <laughs> so, you know, the idea about, so I, I can earn, I can earn money from, from selling magic, you know, and, you know, 500 units of, of phobia. I'm like, well, that's got to be worth it. Absolutely. Mm. So it, it was it was a little bit of everything. OK. And then obviously uh, you brought out Spectators Don't Exist, which the reason I'm bringing that up is somebody asked me on the channel recently, what's uh, some, one of the best DVDs you've ever seen? I had a list of the best DVDs ever produced and I put your Spectators Don't Exist on there. It was incredible. Thank it was you. at a time where you didn't see many DVDs coming out because obviously the market got saturated at a certain point. But this is back in the day where I think uh, L&L were bringing their stuff out and A1 Multimedia were. Yeah. And then this just popped on my radar and some of, uh, there's, there's routines on there. I've got my shelf over there. There's routines on there that I still do to this day. I'm pretty sure the destination box was actually on there as an idea before it got marketed separately. Yeah. Was this something you bought out through a company or did you self-publish it and, and sell that to others as well? Uh, yeah, this was uh, Tim Trono, uh, okay. who uh, had, had asked if I, if I wanted to do the DVD. And I, I had, you know, I had ideas. Um, and again, it was another outlet as, as well. Um, because I kind of also realized, if I'll, I'll take a step back, is after winning the IBM, uh, I was asked to do a lecture tour. And so I, I'd, I'd worked on, on getting a lecture done. And I, and I realized that there, there is this world within magic where, you know, you can teach magicians, uh, you know, give, give lectures, give advice or whatever. And it's another creative outlet it's a case of we'll pay you to come over and we'll, you know, we'll pay your hotel, we'll pay your food and, and all that. Uh, who wouldn't, you know, who, who wouldn't want to do that? So, so that's, that side of things was, was really good. And then, you know, um, I think part of a, a lecture tour, some time was put aside to film the, uh, to film the video. I think it was up in Vermont. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah. It was it was a case of putting some 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 ideas together, some stuff from from the act, I do believe, some other some other ideas as well. Uh, there's a professor's nightmare uh, idea, which which I really like that, that's on there. Coins across, so I, you know I'm still doing these things 
uh, today as well. Uh, and so, yeah, it was it was a DVD that I, I really liked. One thing I wanted was I, I want to perform for real people, as in I don't want to be in a studio. I want to go out in a restaurant and perform for people who are just there because they're wanting to eat and get their real reactions. So yeah. that, that was kind of important um, for, for the DVD or video as it was at the time. Absolutely. Well, you've since, since, since spectators don't exist, you've brought out many, many products. But one thing that I've always noticed is we see creators that churn out tricks all of the time. And you can tell that there's varying levels of quality of the magic that comes out, you know, Let's just say it, Jay Sankey is a perfect example. As much as he's created some amazing magic through the years, there's some stuff that hasn't really hit as hard because the- Are we going to bleep that name out? Oh yeah, it, it, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's do that, shall we? But you don't do that, John. You, when you bring out a trick, it's A, commercial, it's a worker. It's obviously been well thought out and routined. It's not something that you've had an idea for and 24 hours later it's 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 marketed, which you do see these days. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not a constant output. It, 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 you spend time developing your ideas. I suppose the, the, this is leading up to a couple of questions. And one is, do you have any advice for people that maybe want to become creators of magic? Because you've self-published most of the stuff that you bring out and you might put it in Murphy's, it might eventually appear in various different magic shops, but it's not like you've gone to somewhere like Alakazam or Penguin and said, hey, produce this product for me, which is the way that most people do it. You've kind of self-published and it's always really worked for you. So do you have yeah. any advice having spent so long creating and, and marketing your own magic as to somebody who's watching this and thinking, I've got some original ideas. I think that I could... I could I could publish magic as well. Any yep. tips on that side of things? Um, yeah, I think I think you are right. Is is now if you have a camera and a computer, you can put out a product. That's yeah. it. You 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 don't need anything else. Uh, maybe screaming reactions from people who've told to who you've told to scream and react for the trailer. Um, but yeah. I just again, like I said, with performing is, is you you've got to have faith. Is it have faith? You you've got to believe in what you put out. Uh, don't just put stuff out because it's possible. You know, just because you can doesn't mean you should, sort of thing. Of course, there will be people that are saying, well, well, just because we think something isn't very good, it doesn't mean that it isn't very good. But likewise you can tell when something hasn't been thought through uh i mean i'm sure you know i've seen products and i i go well there's a better way to do that you know you you just haven't thought it through and and you can you can also tell that it hasn't really been performed very much at all you know um and so i don't think there's any way to stop people doing it you know um we tell people to not drink and drive and people still drink and drive. So, you know, people don't listen to, uh, to sensible advice. Um, but, you know, I think you show other magicians, show people that have maybe put out some products or not just knowledgeable magicians, you know, don't, don't ask friends who are just going to go, yeah, that's great. Go on, put it out. You know, I, I think, you know, you've, you've got to do a little bit of work ahead of time to find out if it's worth it. The other thing is find out if it's been done before. That's something that people don't bother with. Um, you know, nowadays you can put in, you know, a trick title and Google and see if something's been, been done before. So I think you do have to do a little bit of due diligence uh, in, in that respect. And also I think there is, there is a case to be said that uh, the, the magic dealers, the distributors, um, you know, shouldn't maybe take everything. You know, there, there is such a wide range of, of magic. You could say, well, this, this, someone's going to like it. But I think it's detrimental to the good magic that comes out. And you see it uh, on forums and, and, Facebook and, and Facebook groups. 
is that people lose faith in trailers and people lose faith in uh, pre-release offers because they've been burned too many times before. You know, someone's put out a pre-release to, to get the money. And when the reviews start coming in, it's, it's an awful product or an awful download or something, but they've already got their money. And so now those people are less likely to buy something that is good because of, of the stuff that has been released that really shouldn't be released. Yeah, 100%. And I think the other problem with regards to that as well is um, tricks aren't given room to breathe these days. Like I remember back in the day, a trick would come out and it would have a shelf life of several months. You know, you'd see the same advert yeah. for the same trick in Magic and in Genie every single month, month after month after month. Um, yeah. and, and But these days I can refresh um, somewhere like Penguin Magic and overnight you've got 30 new products like every day. It's kind of like, how can you possibly... Yeah. When there's so and if these are if these are really good magic effects, then fine, you know, more more good magic is being released. But you know, things can get uh, bumped down just because there's more releases. It doesn't matter the quality or anything. As you said, th this is it's the latest, yeah. And that's that's what a lot of people a lot of people care about. So yeah, you, you do get some really good products that you know. Uh, just just go down the list. I mean, really good stuff does last the test of time, which thankfully, you know, I've had some products that have been able to do that. Uh, but it's as a, it, it's just this wave of, of magic that, you know, really shouldn't be out there. And then there maybe needs to be some sort of, um, not police, that, that's way too strong, but just think about, you know, should this actually be released? Should we be spending money on buying stock or advertising? I know, you know, many companies don't keep stock anymore. I think there's but... an element of passing the buck because I've spoken to Murphy's about this in depth and they've actually said that their point of view is they're a wholesaler. It's down to the individual magic shop to decide what to buy in. And they gave me the example of Costco. You said, you know, you go to Costco, are you going to turn around to Costco and say, no, you're not going to get brand of Coke because a lot of people don't like it. You know, it's up to the people that are going in to buy that Coke, whether they decide to stock it in their shop, because if they stock a brand of Coke that nobody's going to buy, well, they're not going to buy it again. So they pass the buck on to the, the magic shops and the magic shops kind of go, well, in order to be competitive, I have to put list everything that Murphy's come out with, because if I don't, my competitors do. And I need to be able to be competitive. And anyway, it should be the it should be the end consumer that's doing their due diligence. And then the end consumer or the magician says, well, no, I don't want to be checking out reviews and spending hours. I just want to know that my magic shop is listing something that that they at least have some sort of faith in. So it's kind of like everybody passes the buck to everyone else, if that makes sense. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not having a go at anybody because I'm, you know. Uh, I'm going to be Swiss on, on this sort of thing and just stay neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it can be the the the, the consumer, uh, but uh, you know, a lot of times, especially with advertise with magic tricks, uh, you don't know what you're buying. You can't get a refund. There, there's all this sort of stuff. So you know, it, it is maybe difficult for the consumer to work out if it is any good because obviously it's the greatest thing and we're giving we, we're going to describe it in the best possible way and you get drawn into it and then you get it and you go oh they didn't tell me that well i can't i can't do that I, no one's no one that's not going to fool anybody and they only find that out after they buy it mm -hmm. uh, but as you said it, it's kind of like airtime for the, the 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 good tricks you know you could say well if, if a trick is really good, it, it will rise to the top and people will talk about it. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really know what the answer is. For me, I just put out tricks that I believe in, that I think are commercial, whatever that means. Uh, you know, it can be done in the real world. It's not just done for the camera. You know, I, I'm, I'm just honest with people as, as much as I can be. Um, with with trailers and stuff like that and yeah the, the magic i do you know i i have worked i have worked on things 
I'm not one of those that sit on an idea for 10 years and then decide to release it. I'm not that bad. But likewise, I'm not going to release something you said in, in, in 24 hours. Um, the only thing I had come up with was something called The Vanishing, which is a little packet trick about Harry Houdini. And I did literally come up with that in 10 minutes. Uh, and that was actually um, put out by Paul Richards, Elmwood Magic. And that's the only trick I've sort of given to someone and say, you know, you, you do it. Um, but other things, yeah, I, I work on it. I have my my circle of uh, confidants that I will show a new idea to and know that they're not going to steal it or, or anything like that. So I think also referring back to a question, uh, however long ago it was, you should have a circle of, of friends that you can show ideas to, you can perform for and get honest feedback. Uh, so yeah, I, I will produce only magic that I think is, is good. And if I don't think it's good, then I, I won't release it. Uh, that a, a case in point of, of about having a circle of, of, of trusted friends you can believe in. I had a product that I had uh, worked on and was going to release at Blackpool a few years ago. Uh, it was based on Paragon 3D. And I was having dinner with uh, Garrett Thomas, uh, Matthew Beach. I showed it to them and they said, uh, don't don't release this and they gave their reasons why and I agreed with them and so I didn't release it I lost money on it but it was the right thing to do because I think you can be so focused and so at the heart of of a product or an idea that you really don't see the negative points of it mm. and it did take a, a, a couple of good friends to tell me why it wasn't a good idea and yeah i i had to go fine i, w I won't release it so mm. i i think we need more of that absolutely completely agree with you and it's so ethical but i want to ask you one question out of everything you've ever released what's your favorite trick oh no sorry i gotta go there i gotta you go have. there because I, you, I, you've done stuff that's completely revolutionized various different genres or genres. I think that the silent treatment is the absolute best opener for a parlor show. You cannot get better. I think nope. that the aim game is the best way to achieve uh, the smash and stab. Uh, I think that um, double back, uh, double back is the double best back. version of Doc Daly's trick that we're ever going to see. You have revolutionized genres and concepts with a lot of the magic that you've brought out so yeah which one which one is this the which is your favorite child um <laughs> I, I i you know like you know there isn't a best version of something i i don't really have i have favorite there's there's favorites for different reasons and this this is the thing um you know, first of all, you know, you said about Dr. Daly's last trick with, with double back, it, it can't be improved. I will never, unless I'm being sarcastic, never call anything the ultimate. It does make me laugh a little bit when I see the ultimate whatever. You know, I, I said, I'd love to go to a pizza parlor and say, can I have your ultimate pizza, but with extra cheese? You know, <laughs> there is no ultimate. There is just what's, what's at the pinnacle at the moment because we don't know what's coming in the future. Mm -hmm. But with regards, as I said, favorites, Double Back was, was my first big release. I, I remember having, it was funny, uh, on the edge of Paul Richard's stand uh, in 2000, in, in San, uh, IBM in San Diego. And I was, you know, I had this little packet trick and I didn't think it would fool magicians. I think they, they, they thought, they think it would be good. It was, it was all right. And I, I'd never seen anything like it. I, I had people coming over. I was told to buy double back or I was told I have to see double back. I was just getting this all the time. And it was just, it was like, wow. Um, and so double back was my first one. So I kind of like that silent treatment is maybe my most well-known or, or the most revolutionary. Uh, I don't, I don't know if there's another magic trick like it. Um, I mean, I can talk about silent treatment a little bit now. Yes, please, please do. Yes. Because 
as I said, it, it's not my, as I have favorites for different reasons, but the, the silent treatment for me is the one where magic for me, it's, it's a sequence of events and then you get a bit of a left turn at the end. So the routine is nothing, uh, sorry, the, the, the surprise at the end has nothing to do with the routine. For example, if you did ambitious card and have it end up inside a box, they don't go, oh, that's why he, that's why the card kept coming to the top. Yeah. Makes no sense. Or you have a, a, a note that ends up in a lemon. You don't get people going, oh, that's why he put them in the envelopes and he burnt the envelopes so he could appear in a lemon. You know, the, the magic at the end is always separate and it, 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 the, the routine doesn't usually lead up to it. But I've said this many times before, is the silent treatment came about because of a film with Nicole Kidman called The Others. Have you, have you seen it? I have. Great film. Have, yeah. And there's a moment at the end where you're watching the film and there's questions that get asked, you know, like, why is the husband left? And why, why is the postman stopped turning up? And why, why? And you get to the end and all of a sudden there's a moment. And you go, what? Hang on. Hang on, I've, I've missed something. What, what's going on here? And then the surprise is revealed. And you go, oh, the, oh, that's why the husband didn't. And that's why this. So the surprise at the end is the reason for things happening in the film. And I came out of the cinema, movie theatre for the Americans, thinking, I want to come up with a trick that has that premise. So it had nothing to do with props, nothing to do with moves or an effect. It was just a premise where something's happening, the audience doesn't really know what, then you get that surprise at the end and the audience realize why you've been doing everything. Yeah. And I genuinely have, I, I hadn't seen that at the time and I can't think of a trick that works like it. And so, Moving on a little bit, at one point I lost my voice. I had a job coming up and I thought, what if I couldn't speak? If I genuinely had lost my voice and I have to work. Yeah. And I realized, and there was a little bit of, um, uh, what's the British film? He's at the door. Uh, Love Actually. Oh, Love Actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. holding the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so there's a little bit of that. And I thought, oh, maybe I could have things written down. And so things snowball from then. So if I'm not talking um, and I've got things on the board, maybe the reason I'm not talking is for the finish. Mm. And we'll give away the, the, the ending is that someone chooses a card from, from cards they, they can see. And when they name their card, I have a card in my mouth and it's the card that they're thinking of. So the whole reason for using the boards, I'm not talking, or so that the, the reason that I'm not talking and using the boards is because I had a card in my mouth at the beginning. So it, it's all of that. So for me, the silent treatment was something completely different in, in terms of premise. Obviously card to mouth exists, um, things, uh, things have been written down before, but this, this sort of combination and the, the premise of people not really knowing where the trick is going and only at the end they realize why the trick's taken place, I, I, I think was brand new. So for me, that, that's why the silent treatment, uh, I think, sparks so much imagination with people and, and really grab people's attention. Um, I so, agree. Yeah. It's, it's, I've been doing it for many, many years. Interestingly, you then brought out a version two with the diamond, which is also very, very good. Yeah, uh, that was actually a uh, probably version three because I bought out a digital version for the iPad. The iPad, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so with that, people could, you know, type in their own routines. Um, I did also do a blank version because obviously when it came out, it was printed in English. I did have someone saying, could, could I do it in Portuguese? I said, I could have it manufactured. How many would you like? And they went six. I'm like, well, if you want to pay 300 pounds each, I can make six of them, you know, have six printed. So I created a blank version so people could write their own uh, in whatever language, then the digital, and then the, yeah, the, the diamond edition, 
um, which uses different props. So they, it uses uh, Sven pads, but they were pre-printed. Uh, it was the first time uh, Brett had actually pre-printed um, Sven pads. So yeah, and, and, and I, I still have ideas for a stage version. That's the one thing I really would like to do. I've, I've, I've got one for myself, but I, I would really like to do it, uh, uh, come out with a commercial version for stand-up and stage, but there, there's so many um, different things that need to be taken into consideration when you're, when you're working on stage as opposed to close-up. So whether or not I do a stage version uh, is, is yet to be seen. I'd, I'd buy it. I'll be the first in the queue, John, 100%, because I know the power of, of, of silent treatments. Now, before we go any further, actually, we've been talking about your products for a while. I'd yes. like to throw a link up at the bottom because a lot of the things that you do are exclusive to you. You can't get them anywhere else. So what's the URL for people to visit at this point now so they can they can go and check out your range? Uh, so we have, um, it is onlinemagicshop.co.uk. Perfect online magic shop and that's got pretty much everything that you do that has everything that i do absolutely excellent stuff um, so yeah so no. as i said with, with your with the favorites going back to that i have favorites for for, for different reasons it, it might be the way that i came up with it it may be because it solves a problem a, a lot of what i do i see something and i think can it be improved that was the same thing with the pain game um so like flexion actually came about through accident just playing around, so that was that was my key bend. Um, so yeah, there's there's all all different things. You know, rule of three as well is another one which is, I, I really like it because of the premise. You know, so many of the things I, I like not because of the moves or the props or even the effect. It's just what what is the premise? What is the hook that would keep people interested and make people care? So for me, that's that's really important. And it shows how much you think. I'm doing a video for this channel. By the time this comes out, it's probably been done, but I'm doing a video and I mentioned this for you off camera, the best accessories of all time. Uh, and, and two in a list of 10, two of them are from you, which is um, perfect score. And the cube tube, which is an amazing- Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Which is an amazing accessory. And that just shows you your thinking behind things. You're just taking something that's already great and you're just making it so much better. Yeah, uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, Perfect Score is an example. Um, so Paragon had come out. And again, Paragon is another of my, my favorites uh, because I, I'd never had a product get that sort of reaction at Blackpool. I, I, I was just doing it. Uh, it's a, a card to clear box. Obviously, David Regal was the first person um, that, that had, had come out with it and Wayne Dobson had had his version as well and I was playing around with Wayne's and I didn't like the method it, it obviously great effect I didn't like the method so I, I was trying to improve it for myself and I sent Wayne a video and he, he emailed me back and he said what the hell did you just do because I did it as though I was performing um, 360 but with my method and so I knew that I had something but when I did it at Blackpool, I was just doing, you know, I was just had the card in the box and you tip it out and there it is. And people were like, well, you just tip the card out. I went, did you think I just tipped that card out of the box? And I went, well, you did, didn't you? And so I had to actually get them to sign a card and then find it in the box. And that's when I'm like, I, I genuinely, I think I fooled every magician. Yeah. I'm not going to say that lightly because I hate it when magicians go, nobody ever sees that or everybody was fooled. But I genuinely think I fooled every magician that saw it. And again, I had people coming over like 9.30 on the Thursday. I put my bag down. I turn around and there's like half a dozen people just standing there waiting to see it. So I, I, I never had a reaction. And I, I genuinely think it is the best card to clear box. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's great for for, di for different reasons. So, so perfect score came about because of the clear boxes, because again, as as we were talking about um, uh, before we uh, before we started filming with uh, Mercury card folds, 
you've got this perfectly folded card that people can see and you tip it out and it's, it's this horrible sort of uh, uh, Dali type Picasso-esque type folded thing. Mm -hmm. And you go, it didn't look like that when it, I don't, I know about refraction, but it, it's not that bad that it goes from looking perfectly folded to a complete mess. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I thought, you know, Tommy Wonder had obviously uh, had the idea to score the cards and I just created a template to make it quick and easy to do uh, quarters and sixths as well. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was again to solve a problem. You know, how do you, how can you make the Mercury card fold easier, score it? Well, how can you make sure that you don't, you know, you can get it in the middles and you don't score too much and start cutting it. So the, you know, again, yeah, perfect scores solved the problem for me. So here's a question with all these products that you've got, what made you decide to bring out a book? Because obviously a few years ago now you bought out experience with Josh and Andy vanishing, yeah. Inc., I believe. Yep. Uh, which which I know from interviewing Andy was very popular and sold out numerous times and got reprinted and so on and so forth. Yeah, uh, rightfully so because it's an incredible book. Thank you. What what um, what made you decide to put a put a book together? Because that's a very labour intensive project, isn't it? Yes, it is. Um, and yeah, Andy Andy asked me because uh, th this would be their very first book release. Which was kind of a nice honor. Mm. Um, and Andy, he flew me to Paris and he bought me dinner, a lovely hotel. No, it didn't, it didn't happen like that. No. Um, no like he, that. he asked, <laughs> and, and I kind of wanted to put my ideas down for posterity, if, if you like. So I'd, I'd done the, uh, you know, I, I'd done the DVD. Um, and so I, I wanted a book for posterity you know I, I have ideas there were some ideas that i hadn't released and you know andy wanted andy wanted uh to publish it so i said yeah sure um and so that's how it is i had john lovick uh uh do it as well so um that was that was just a really good thing and so yeah i, I worked on it and i i don't think i will come up with another book because all my thinking is pretty much in there. Mm. There are routines in there, there are tricks in there, but for me, it's everything else around it. So the IBM Act is in there, but I, I talk about routining because there, there's not one element of the act that I could take out because everything else would fall apart. You yeah. know, so it's about that. It's a, there's there's a, an essay on Schrodinger's card which is about card to envelope. And I explain why you should never open the envelope, never get them to open the envelope. And so there's, there's things like that. Um, so yeah, it, it was just a way to, to put my ideas down, get them out there. And, you know, part of me, you know, I, I do want magicians to, you know, if I can help magicians, you know, future generations, current generations, past generations, yeah. then, you know, that, that's, that's a good thing. You yeah. know, I know some people, there, there is ego about it. Uh, it it's not about ego. It, it really is about loving magic and wanting to help others. People can disagree with me. That's fine. You know, uh, I mean, they're wrong. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we can have a debate because if you... You know, if, if you can talk about, if someone disagrees with me on something and, and they can say, this is why, that's fine. I'm, I'm up for that. And I, I'm, I'm happy to hold my hands up and go, actually, yes, you're right. You, you, that, that is a better way. Or, yeah, you, you're, you're right with that, that, that thinking. So, so I want to put out my ideas to magicians. They can take them at face value, do the routines take on board my, my thinking, my premise, you know, the, the way I approach magic, whatever psychology I may be able to add. But also, I'm happy if it makes them think and go, I disagree with him. Yeah, that's a good thing as well. You know, because you know, that thing of, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, yeah, terrible advice. Okay. Terrible. It means everything's fine. 
just believe what you see, what you read, and just do it that way, mm. rather than questioning everything. So, you know, people buy my books, people even, you know, if they want to buy my, my tricks, watch my, my DVDs, great. And if you don't like something, that's, that's fine. I, at least I've made you think about why you might not like it. So, you know, for, for me, that's a, that, that's, a, that's a good enough reason to, to put stuff out. Fantastic. And I completely agree, 100%. I, I want to <laughs> I want to ask you one more question before we start to wrap this up and 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 I want to so soon you, I know right we're, we're not not quite we're not there yet we're not there yet but okay. can we can we talk about um you I'm I'm going to put my foot in it now but I'm sure I'm a hundred percent sure you you did Penn and Teller didn't you yes I did yes um can you talk to us about that experience because obviously no. okay fair enough <laughs> God, what, would you, what would you like to know just, just because that's another question that's come up on this channel um obviously they're still going strong all these years later and people yep. always question me should i enter for us and you were on at the very start weren't you or near the you're on the first yeah season. yeah um, uh, john john and ben did the trailer uh, not the trailer sorry the um the pilot and, it, and when it when it went to a series i i was in the the, the very first show and, and back then, it was a very different thing to what it is now, because I imagine, and I've never done it, but I can imagine there was still a question over what the format of the show was going to be, because let's be honest, Penn and Teller are known for being the bad boys of magic and exposing magic, and, and, and they're asking magicians to come on, and they're going to try and figure their tricks out. There's probably, yeah. these days, we know what the format is. We know what they're going to do. There's no risk there. But way back in season one, there was a risk um, of going on this 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 show and you know like what are they going to do to me are they going to expose my trick to the public yeah. so i suppose the question is what made you decide to go on on there um it was there a particular reason and did you get out of it what you hoped to achieve so yeah i was <clears throat> i was actually asked <clears throat> to do pen and teller uh, as opposed to you know um putting putting in a, a request or sending in a, in a routine because I think at the time they just wanted to get magicians on the show. Uh, but one thing that I was determined to do was uh, to, to do a, an idea of mine or a routine of mine. And I decided to go with the pain game, which uh, in retrospect was a really bad idea. Uh, but I, I, wanted to, I wanted to do it. Uh, I thought, it's a it's a Saturday night prime time TV show. Is it worth doing? Yeah, of course it is. You know who who wouldn't want to do that? You know. So yeah, I, I I chose to do it. I did the pain game. I realized that being a commercial product, they may know the method. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to do was to change the method. It couldn't be too different because the pain game has its own method. But I just wanted it to be different enough that if they said the actual method, they would be wrong. Um, and so, yeah, I, I did. Uh, I, I did it. They they did want me to. Well, I, I wanted to use Jonathan Ross's hand. This is how safe the pain game can be, as I was perfectly happy to do to use Jonathan Ross's hand. <clears throat> they said. Uh, they said no. That that wouldn't be that wouldn't be a good visual. Uh, so they wanted me to use a girl from the audience, and I I wasn't really comfortable with getting a girl up from the audience, mm -hmm. and and doing this even though it's perfectly safe. Just the visuals of it. Yeah. Uh, but they said we we really want you to choose a girl from the audience, and when the production team put it like that and, and there were the things that, that, that were going on at the time and we realized you know they didn't need all of us we, we could be cut from the final show so I have a decision to make is either say no I'd prefer not to do it than to use a girl from the audience and not be on Saturday night primetime tv for, for a brand new series it's not like it's been running for 
20 years and we're still going this is the you know this is right at the start so people would be interested or not do it because i i said no to the to the production company so i said okay i'll do it there were certain safety precautions put in place so that even though i knew it was absolutely safe they needed to know that it would it was absolutely safe to, to carry on filming uh so i had you know, I had those things worked out. And yeah, I brought, I brought the girl up. The other thing with that is whilst they're miking her up, I'm just having to stand there, which, which was not good. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as you can see, if you, if you ever get to see it, uh, I just made sure that she was okay. Not, phys you know, not the physical side, but the emotional side. I wanted her to know that I, I really cared about her and I wasn't just using her as a prop. And yeah. that, if I thought, I thought, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to make sure that I come across as someone who actually cares about the person. You'll get people saying, well, why would you put her in such a situation? You know, I knew that it, it was perfectly safe. Um, and it, it off a, a slight tangent, magic isn't just about making people laugh. You know, you, you can make people think about really deep and meaningful things. You can make people scared you know people go on roller coasters because it's really scary mm -hmm. but it's a lot of fun so you know so to be to put people in a situation i think it, as long as you put it across right and you treat them right i i think is okay so yeah that that was that and then you know i i did it um there was a little bit of a a, a thing after I finished, because Jonathan Ross came over to me a lot quicker than I thought he would. So that that threw me as well. And um, f from what I've heard from people afterwards, um, doing a faux danger routine isn't the best thing to do for Penn and Teller, which, which I, I found out afterwards. How come? But I, I, I don't know. I was just, I, I just had people telling me that, you know, doing doing um, uh, fake dangerous routines is, is not their their best thing. Um, so yeah, it was it was good to do, but it wasn't a fun thing to do. You know, yeah. um, one of the offshoots was it. I was I was uh, doing um, an event, um, and there were a load of kids there. And it was, you know, obviously, can you, can you do something for the kids? And this was only uh, like a few weeks after Penn and Teller had been shown on TV. And one of the kids had recognized me. And so <laughs> I borrowed one of their phones and I brought up the YouTube clip of me on Penn and Teller. Mm -hmm. So I'm at an event holding a phone with them watching me on the phone rather than actually doing anything for them live it was it was a really weird thing to do but you know as long as you're entertaining people uh, at, at the event that that's fine so yeah it's uh it, it, it's a stepping stone Penn and teller was 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 a stepping stone something else to add i think if you can add if you can be an award-winning magician international you know of one international and let's say a member of the inner magic circle and appeared on Penn and teller each of those things on their own, maybe, okay. But the reason for doing this, the maybe going back again, the reason for entering a competition, the reason for, for taking a TV spot is you add them all up. And if people are looking for a reason to book you rather than someone else, there, yeah. there you have it. That you makes know? sense. It's like social proof, isn't it? And you know, you're proving to anybody who's considering booking you, yes, you are the right person for this job. I wouldn't say the right person for the job because, you know, you, you, you can show yourself to be at a certain level, mm. but that doesn't necessarily mean you can entertain at a corporate event. Mm. You know, you, you could, you could be, you could be a, a, an award winning magician. You, you could win this and, and be on that TV show, but can you be amongst baronesses or can you be amongst lords and ladies or presidents and ceos and and have a certain demeanor which is what they're looking for 
rather than hi everyone do you want to pick a card mm -hmm. you're not right for their event you yeah. know so i think what it does do is show that you are at a certain level which is what they maybe want mm -hmm. then it's a completely different discussion as to whether you are able to fulfill the brief that the client wants and on that subject do you have i mean this is a, a, a huge topic that we could probably spend 10 hours talking about and if still we can beat sean farquhar's record i'm up for it bring it back over to the uk um, is there any advice that you can give to people who are um maybe they're they're full-time or they're part-time and they're struggling to get the type of work that they want or they're struggling to get the um the the volume of work or even the level of pay in terms of how much they feel they're worth versus what they're Ooh. getting. Uh, because let's be honest, you perform at a very high level. Um, you know, there's certain levels and, and you are right up there and you've never, you know, outside of maybe last year, you've never had to worry too much about getting gigs. You know, you have a lot of people that are knocking down your door wanting to book you. Um, and a lot of people would like to be in that situation. Is there any advice that you can give on making your career bigger and better than where you are at the moment? So can I give advice to people to take gigs away from me? Is that what you're saying? Basically, is what I'm asking. Yeah, John. Yeah, I'll, I'll bottom line. That's it, yeah. what we, we need more really good magicians mm, to, to yeah. go out offering their services in yeah. the same areas. That's, how that's I, great. How can I create more competition for you? Well, anyone outside Hertfordshire? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, the, the thing with with pay and money, that that's a completely different thing about how much people should charge. Uh, I don't think you should just pick a number, but that, that's another story. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if you want to do, you know, if you want to do corporate events, then go to places where people are looking for suppliers for corporate events. You know, nowadays, you know, we've got Facebook groups. That, that's easy. Instagram, whatever, social media, you know, with hashtags. You know, if you put hashtags children's parties or hashtag you know, corporate entertainment, whatever, you'll get different people seeing. So, you know, go go to where you want to perform. Yeah, that's it. I mean, there, there are there are things about, you know, when, when you can go out to places, you know, go, you, you might get people say, uh, go go to the bars where, you know, people hang out after, after work, you know, where, where, where's the business sector? Where do they hang out? You'll get people just, you know, just do, do some magic tricks. I personally wouldn't do this. But, you know, there are people that would say, just go do some tricks, hand out a card. You, you never know. Um, but mix in the circles where you want to be. Yeah. And, and again, have, uh, you know, have a group of people that you're happy to work with to give jobs to. You know, I'm sure the children's entertainers, that, that, that's a whole different area to me, but you'll get people giving jobs to each other. You know, get friends. If you've got people that do trade show work, you know, if you want to get into trade shows, hang out with other people that do trade shows, you know? So, yeah, that, that's uh, for what it's worth. That, that's kind of my advice. What you're basically saying is network, you know, build up relationships with people. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I think also you do need to be honest with what area you might want to go into. You know, you, you could say, well, I, I hear that the corporate market, you know, you can be earning up, you know, four figures or more in the corporate. But if you're not the sort of person who fits in, then it, it's not for you. It's the same as, you know, if, if you want to be Channing Pollock you know, suave and sophisticated. But if you're not physically tall and sophisticated, don't be Channing Pollock, yeah. you know, or, or Lance Burton or, or, or whatever, you know. If you're a cheeky chappy, maybe that will, 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 will steer you in. Or, you know, you may have to put on an act if you are going to go into an area. You know, you might be a really serious person, but you love doing kids' magic, you know, yeah. and... Kids magicians, as you know, is a fortune to be made. 
you know, yeah. parents want their kids to be entertained. Yeah. But, you know, if you're a really serious person, you've got to put on an act to, to fit into that market. So, yeah, f- figure out what sort of persona as well is, is appropriate. Okay, that's great advice. Uh, again, really, I hope that people who are watching this are listening very carefully because the amount of wonderful advice that you've given during the course of this interview, it's just incredible. I just hope people are watching this. Oh, they will be. <laughs> it's all about the likes. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna be watching this in spades. I know they are. So what's, what's next for you? And what I mean by that is, yeah. you, well, obviously after this specific thing, but you've accomplished so much through your career. You really have in every element. You know, you, you, you perform at a very high level. We've talked about that. Uh, you've won some amazing competitions and uh, won the respect of your peers over and over again. Uh, as a creator and as an innovator, you've got some incredible products. You've, you've literally changed the game. Is there anything left on your magical bucket list that you haven't achieved that you'd like to do um, or, or stuff that you, you're planning on doing in the future? I, I really want to uh, work the parlor at the Magic Castle, oh. if anyone's watching. Um, now, I, I mean, I've, I've, I, I want to keep doing what I'm doing, but mm. just... Um, one thing I am going to do is turn my phone off. <laughs> um, one, no, I, I just love what I do. I said, I've got to meet some amazing people w- within magic and, and, and away from magic. You know, magic's taken me to places I've, I've, I'd never otherwise go to w- without magic. Um, and it's a cr- creative friendships. So I, I just I want to keep doing what I'm doing, mm. keep coming up with f- for the magicians, you know, keep coming up with ideas that maybe people haven't seen before and that people want to do. Mm. So there, there is there is a, a side to go. People are actually performing the tricks that I've created. But there is also this sense of of making. I wouldn't say making magic better. Uh, it, it's the wrong way, it, it, you know, sort of an egotistical way to do it. Um, but as I said, the, 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 the tricks I come out with, the, the routines I come out with are hopefully a, a, a stepping stone towards other people going, oh, I'll take John Allen's idea and add to that. So just, you know, being, being part of, you know, maybe magical history that way. So if you take something like the silent treatment and if somebody in the future wants to uh, make an improvement on it, then that would be great. You know, I am just part of the, the, the journey that magicians, magicians are on. It is all about, uh, what's the phrase, standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I've been influenced by people. I have had my, my mentors as, as well uh, and magicians that I've looked up to. Um, and so, yeah, I think for me, more of the same in-person gigs at this moment would be great to, to, to have as, as a starting point. They are coming back. But I, so I, just, I, just love, I just love what I do, the places I get to, to visit, people I get to see, friendships that I've made. Uh, it's, just, it's just wonderful. And would you, on, on two things to pick up on on that, would you ever, you, you mentioned at the very beginning of the interview about your reasons for entering competitions and you wanted to kind of prove to yourself would you ever enter another competition again? Like, would you ever, if somebody knocked on your door and said, excuse me, Mr. Allen, we'd like you to enter FISM this year. Um, would that be something that would be interesting to you from a creativity point of view? Or is that kind of ship sailed at this point? I think for me, it, it has sailed a little bit. Uh, I'm not into fooling magicians. You know, if, if what I come up with does fool them, like as I said before, like with, with, with Paragon, then that, that's great. But I'm not into spending energy and time working on something just to fool magicians. I, I love watching that sort of stuff. You know, I've gone to so many conventions and I've been privileged to be invited to conventions and I see people and I, I love magic. I love being fooled. 
the the skill of performance it's just in, incredible um but i think it is like like we said before with like children's magic and corporate is a completely different skill fooling magicians is a completely different skill as well and it, it's not one that i i'd be interested in to work on an act yeah it's not just about that there is timing and there's routining and everything else and you know my 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 efforts are are elsewhere but as we said before if you can come up with with an act that is good for fism you know then that you know that that is fantastic 100% and are you planning on i mean obviously we're hoping that the world is opening up and i know from speaking to russ stevens and russ brown that they're very much hoping that blackpool will be going ahead next Yay. year um, so uh, you always seem to have something really cool and innovative coming out every year. As I say, you don't bring stuff out all the time, but when you do, there always seems to be a new <coughs> release of Blackpool. Uh, do you have something in mind that you're working on for Blackpool 2022? Well, in previous years, my, uh, my plan would always be, um, around cause, uh, Blackpool is sort of towards the end of February. So for me, it would always be early January, come up with an idea and desperately try and get it out for Blackpool. That, that just have something new for Blackpool. Uh, it's, I know I said about, you know, you don't just come up with stuff for the sake of it, but you know, that's the thing with Blackpool magicians. It's great. What's new? Yeah, I don't care about the old stuff. What's new? That's all we care about. Mm -hmm. That's not everybody. Okay. But just uh, generalizing. Um, so no, it, it is that timing. It is actually nice to have, you know, February as almost like a deadline to work towards mm. for something that's brand new. So one, one thing actually with the, the pandemic, I, I realized was that my creativity did drop off and that I wasn't coming up with any new ideas. And I realized part of it is not the performing, but I also realized that there's, there's no stimuli for me. Going to different places, talking to other magicians, watching magic, all the things that, even you know, like going to the cinema, as I mentioned for, for the silent treatment, is just getting different things uh, that would stimulate me to come up with a premise or a story, or I don't like that because of this, and maybe I can, I can you know uh, come up with an, another idea and it was only when i did a few little gigs and was watching zoom shows and doing zoom shows and things like that that my creativity came back so i have in the last couple of months uh had some ideas uh i will mention not promoting it at all here but i i did have uh, one idea uh, during lockdown called all or nothing which um, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it, but the, the trailer caused a bit of a stir because I didn't, I didn't put up a performance of it and I didn't even tell anybody what the whole effect was. Mm. But I was merely saying it's very good or it, it's good, it's excellent. These people also think it is and just trust me look at what I've produced before. And again, it goes back to coming out with decent products. If, if you don't have a name, people are a bit wary. If you do have a back catalog, like you know uh, uh, Richard Sanders or Greg Wilson, Dan Harlan, if they come out with stuff, you know what they've done before. Yeah. So you're gonna be interested. Even if they can't tell you, you know it's pretty much gonna be good. So that was pretty much my trailer for All or Nothing was just believe me i'm being honest just trust me so all or nothing was was the big thing during lockdown that i had th th this creative spark for and that was only after i was had uh, you know some zoom chats with with some friends so now jobs are coming back and, and there's more shows and 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 things like that my creativity is as i said before it, it is coming back and yeah, there, there are some ideas, probably got about four, four ideas. Um, 
one of them, unfortunately, um, has had to be delayed quite a bit. Can't go into it too much, but it has been delayed, which is a, is a bit unfortunate. But yes, Blackpool 2022, there will be definitely some, uh, some more products, some, some more ideas. And hopefully, maybe something that I don't even know yet. Yeah, because you never know where inspiration is going to hit, right? Ab absolutely. And, and that's the thing. Um, again, just slight tangent. We were talking about maybe advice for magicians, uh, maybe in general, is you've got to have interest outside of magic. Yeah. Because, you know, peop people will be talking about things at events. And if you go... Joe Biden? What? Who? Who's, who's, who is Boris Johnson? I have, what, what is Brexit? I have no idea. You know, or find out, you know, Andy Murray. Find out, found out about the football. Just have an interest in other things. And your magic will actually improve because you're not just so focused on one thing. Uh, I know people also have been uh, recently, uh, someone had asked a question about, I've got two hours with 40 people you know how, how do i how do i deal with it well if you only know about performing magic tricks you're going to struggle but if if you're as i said at the start if you're a people person and you know about some pop culture you know what's going on have an interest in things you're going to be fine you know so uh yeah I forget what the point was because I went off on a tangent. Well, well, no, and I'm glad you did. I completely agree with you. I've said on this channel, the best magic book that any magician can buy is something like How to Win Friends and Influence People because I think when people get into magic, they they obsess over learning the latest trick and the latest move and I need to learn about this and this and this and this and this and they forget that commercial close-up magic is more about walking up to oh. a complete group of strangers who you don't know, and within a couple of seconds, interrupting their conversation and getting them to a point where they want to not just watch you, but listen to what you've got to say and stop talking about what they were talking about before. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I, I have started my lectures by saying my first priority as a magician is not to entertain people. It is not even to do any magic for people. Those are not my first priorities. And then I just carry on. I'm like, what? What the hell do you mean? As, sorry, what, what, what's the first priority as a magician? I say your first priority is to make people care. Yeah. Because if they don't care about you, the props, the story, anything, if they don't care, doesn't matter what you do. You, know, you, you ask an American if they'd like to hear about the, the, the greatest cricket match of all time. No, they don't care about cricket. So why should they get, you know, so you have to make them care. So this is why when people ask, what's how, how do you what trick should you start with? You know, what, what's the best you, you said about the best opener, but you don't start with a, a, a trick because why should they care? You know, maybe you could find a way, you know, if it's pick a card, this is a really good trick. Trust me, it's a good trick. It's a great trick. It's the best trick in the world. I don't care. You've got to make them care first. And again, that comes from not just being all about the trick, all about other people. Uh, there's also recently, oh, any card at any number. Uh, I, I have a version of that. But I, I hear people going, it's such a boring trick. You know, what, why would anybody be interested in, you know, you've got to sit through counting to 46. My best performance of it was when I genuinely had to count to 47 because it's not about finding the card at the number it's a fantastic metaphor it's it's a it's it offers so many opportunities to entertain people yeah. if you're just going pick a card or think of a card think of a number let's count down to that number and see if the card's there there it is it's so blinkered towards the trick you have got to think of magic as as a metaphor or a, some way to connect with people away from the uh, the actual trick itself so that may have answered the question from 20 minutes ago i have no idea i think it did i think it did but you know i know there's going to be people watching this at this point and they're going to be thinking that makes there's people still watching well done 
There they Thank are. You. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but they're going to they're going to be saying to themselves, "Okay, that makes sense. What John's just said there, that makes absolute sense." I hope so. How do I do that? How do I make my magic more meaningful? So it's not just look, the tenth card is your card, as opposed to you know, well, making magic meaningful. If they buy my book, no, <laughs> I mean yes, they should. How do they make that? Um, I don't think you can, you, you know, you can't force people to be entertaining. Uh, I, I said it before, you know, you, uh, people can tell if you're being genuine. Even if you've created a character, that character has to appear genuine. Or just be, be so sincere in your fakeness that people will be interested in you. But as a, I've said it before, how how can you make how can you you know can can people learn to be more interesting and to make the magic more interesting yeah but it's got to, it's got to come from them you know if you if people learn oh if i say if i if i give this presentation it will be entertaining but if it sounds like you are just going through the motions and you don't really believe what you are saying this will come across to people Mm. It, it the, the classic thing about oh that's a really funny line I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna use that and they do it why the hell did that not get the same reaction as the other the, the guy i took it from it's because you don't have that conviction in the line it, it doesn't come from you yeah so you know you've you've got to be genuine in who you are um i mean if you take someone like rob zabrecki He's not a happy-go-lucky, fun persona, but there's still something, some quality about him that makes you, in, you know, makes you care about him, makes him interesting, and that you like him. Yeah. So you know, it's not just about making people laugh or being funny. You've just got to make people care about you, yeah. and so that that's that's the quality that you've got to find in yourself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's amazing. That's really cool. I want to ask you one thing that you mentioned earlier on. I'm a huge Don Allen fanboy, as you know. And Stop the it. first thing I do when I get to a convention is run over to your stand. And then I thought you were going to say the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is you go to the room with all the posters. I have and a shrine. Statuettes, a little shrine. shrine. There's, there's, there's like okay. spotlights on it. It's amazing. It's great. The um, first thing you do when you <laughs> but, but you know, I mean, I, I, at Blackpool, I bring people yes. over to your stand. I find people that I haven't seen. Because you know it frustrates me that we look for the new shiny thing and we forget about the older stuff that is better in many cases. And so I'm always bringing people over going, watch Double Back, watch this, watch that. Watch that. Forget about that. That's going to break. Yeah. Um, and as a self-confessed John Allen fanboy, I've never heard of All or Nothing. I like, didn't even know it existed. I mean, admittedly, I was a bit busy being depressed during lockdown, so maybe that's why it flew over my radar. But, like, is this available somewhere? Because I was listening to you talking about this, and I'm like, that's me. I can trust John. I don't even need to. You're one of the few people who I'll just go over and I'll decide that I'm going to buy something off your stand, even yeah. if I've not seen a trailer or a performance, because I just know it's going to be good. Yeah, well, as it all, all or nothing is, it, it's kind of a premise, that is linked to, it's based on like the 50-50 choice. Mm. Uh, and it can extend to bank night, but it, it works so well with a 50-50 choice. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just a way to make it better and to make people care about it more. Because a, a lot of times, uh, which of these two things, uh, you know, uh, which of these two things do you want? Do you want this one or do you want that one? You want this one? Oh, never mind. Oh, it's a fifty-pound note or something. You know. All right. Well done. You know your game, your rules. You're in control, and you win. Mm. Thanks. So, all or nothing is just a way to kind of extend that a little bit further. Oh, yeah. It has other applications, but if you like doing the fifty-fifty choice, and again, people will say it's just fifty-fifty. Why should anyone care? And it was Max Maven said, you know, life and life or death is just 50-50. Mm -hmm. So I, I do like, I, 
the, the, the best question you can ask in magic is why. That you can ask what, how, when, what, but why? So why should anyone care about a 50-50? Solve that problem. Why, I, I had with, with the pain game, why is everybody injuring themselves? Why are these really good magicians impaling their hands? Come up with that, you know? Think, just ask why. So with all or nothing, why should anyone care about 50-50? You know, then, then all or nothing is, is the answer. Uh, as I said, it's one of those things as well. I took the choice um, to not reveal it because there are some things where you go, oh, oh, right, thanks, thanks. I, I can see from the trailer. I can see from the performance. Yeah, I can do that. Forget about all the, the nuances and all the subtleties and everything else. They can see it and there it is. You know, for example, if, if I make up a trick, there's a great trick you've heard about. And when you see it, you go, oh, it's just a Svengali deck. Oh, great. OK, thanks very much indeed. You don't go and buy it yeah. because you think you know everything about it. All or nothing does does come in that category. So, yeah, it's it, it was perfect for Zoom. That was the other thing, because, you know, people were coming up with with tricks for Zoom. Uh, it does work for uh, in person as well. Thank goodness. But. Uh, yeah, it uh, it is available. If I'm doing the promotional bit, uh, it is available on the uh, onlinemagicshop.co.uk, which will appear somewhere here at some point. Absolutely, it's right it's there. Perfect. Right now. We'll we'll edit that in post. Um, so yeah, trust me on that one. In I fact, do. I may well do it for you afterwards, and you can then add in <laughs> what you think of it. I will. That's a good idea. Go. 100%. Um, you mentioned Zoom shows. Uh, how did you find that? Because I've been very open, you know, with Zoom. Uh, I, I, it was a lifesaver at the time, but I'm so glad I'm doing live, live shows. Um, yep. did, I personally thought that we were going to see a lot. I didn't think live shows would be coming back as quickly as they are. I thought there'd be more emphasis on virtual shows for a very long period of time and although people are still booking virtual shows and zoom shows i think they're a much smaller percentage than i anticipated i don't know how do yeah, you... i think i think in this country definitely i, I I've, I've seen online people are saying i've still got zoom shows coming in i'm going to stay with zoom shows and offer zoom shows uh but i i didn't jump into them Partly, well, there, there's several reasons. Uh, so we had the, the pandemic started like March was, was the first lockdown. And you go, you know, why would, why would I want to spend money on lights and cameras and God knows what? It might be a couple of months. I, I'm one of the lucky ones because I, I do have the product range. So it, it wasn't just performing that was giving me my, my income. You know, it does help when there's some expensive items that people are buying rather than just loads of 15 pound ones as well. So I, I didn't want to jump in with expense. I also didn't want to just stick myself in front of a, a, a rubbish camera in my kitchen or my lounge and just do tricks for people because we're happy to do something, you know. So, you know, backdrop camera lighting when it started to get towards august and still things weren't really happening i go I, I should probably start doing it i mean i was i was maybe thinking about it and working out what i would do but i i didn't want to just jump into zoom shows i wanted to have a certain level of professionalism before i did them i i didn't really do that many notice the past tense there mm -hmm. i did enjoy doing them the performing as we saw before we started filming i hate the technical technical side of things yeah because if a camera doesn't work or the sound and everything seems to be on i'm like why is this not working it should just work mm -hmm. so i hated that but i i genuinely did love the performance i think a lot of people that didn't like zoom were the ones that were just doing the magic tricks yeah you know they, they weren't you know, people talk about interacting with your audience. That isn't just, so could you give me a number? 
or where would you like to go on holiday? That's not interacting with your audience. You know, for me with a Zoom, it, you know, I'd, I'd, look at, I'd look at yours and going, you couldn't even be bothered to sit in front of a bookshelf. I mean, what sort of Zoom meeting is this? You know, where's your bookshelf? You know, and then I would have someone pointing out their bookshelf and I'd notice them. So I'd say something about them. Mm. I asked if someone didn't mind, didn't mind uh, being stabbed with a, a knife and someone held up their cat. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that, you know. Mm. And so it, Zoom shows maybe, I mean, I would always be looking for people to bounce off of when I'm working in person. But I think Zoom shows you can do the same with those. A lot of them are maybe more structured, uh, scripted. I, I just I just wing a lot of things and you know whatever I'm given I'll I'll comment on, and just make people feel feel part of it. And so for me that was that was important for Zoom shows. I didn't get to do it that often, and thankfully in person shows are coming back, and so I, I can do that. Uh, you know, with people in the flesh. Absolutely. I mean, they are clothed, but they are in the flesh. There is flesh there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, there is flesh. There is flesh. And um, I, I am going to wrap this up. I think we've come close to beating Sean. I don't think we're there, but I think we've... Well, let me tell you about 1996. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Go on, if people want to see, obviously, you do an amazing lecture. I've watched you lecture several times, and it's always informative, and it's not a deal of them. I mean, that's what I hate about a lot of like, and I understand as a creator myself, I understand why there are lectures that are done in a deal of them format, because you have to make the lecture pay in order to go out and do it. Yeah, yeah. But I think that the best lectures are where there's products that are demonstrated that people can buy, but there's also a lot of other value that's given as well. Yeah. And I think you've managed to find in your lecture that sweet spot perfectly. I think that you've, you've hit the nail just on the head. So for people that, uh, you know, that are booking lectures, because a lot of societies and a lot of conventions that do watch this channel are now in a situation where they're starting to think about live lectures again, and they're starting to fill their calendars up ready for September in anticipation that everything's going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your lecture? How do people contact you about it? Do you have more than one lecture? Just you know, can you spend a couple yeah. of minutes promoting that? Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I did have a, a lecture uh, that I had started to, to do, and I, I'd done them in, in the UK and abroad as well. Um, and then obviously the pandemic hit. So I still have, I still have that lecture. And yeah, I, I, I think you're right. The, the dealer dem, if it's, if it's promoted as a dealer dem, you know what you're getting. But for me, it, it is that that balance. And even if I'm doing a trick that you can only do if you buy it, um, I will offer something different. Double back is a perfect example in that it's not just about the trick. It's everything around it. For me, it's not even a packet trick. It's a way to start things off. So I talk about the psychology. Of, of double back as well uh, and the, the little points of, about it rather than just here's the moves you need to you know you, you buy the cards and here's how you do the trick most of the explanation for that is about the performance uh, for example you know I'm going to put a card on someone's hand yeah so we, we, we name the card and we put it on their hand so many times you'll get people saying, and if you can just put your finger, if you can just put your hand on top of it to make sure that I can't get to it. Well, that's way too much emphasis on a card that we just, you know, we, we, we've dealt with that and now we're moving on. So I talk about why you shouldn't put too much heat on this card. So there's all those little bits of information and, and the same with uh, Paragon. I, I used to have it with the destination box. Again, people talk about the box. They talk about the moves that are needed. They talk about a clear box or an opaque box, things like that. But what people don't talk about is how you use the prop. So I use that prop 
to find out about my audience. And I will go about that. I will, I can find out so much about my audience just from one question, which is important because then I know what level to aim at. Are they all going to be childish? Are they all going to be serious? Do they want to see me? Do they not want to see me? How much effort do I have to put in? And I can find that out from the props that I'm using. So I'll, no, I won't give it, I won't give it, I won't give it away. It's in my lecture. Um, but for me, yeah, that, that's what I try and put across in the lecture is it's not just about the tricks. It's not just about the props. You will learn other things about the performance of magic, performing for people and what else the tricks can do for you away from the actual effect. So there is all, there is all that. I mean, obviously there, there are tricks that aren't, uh, you know, that, uh, that are not, you, you do, I'll rephrase that. There are, there are tricks that I will teach and I teach the methods as well. So they're in the lecture notes, you know, they're not actual products. Um, one of my favorites is um, a torn and restored napkin, which can work for kids. It's great for children. I've done it so many times for, for kids at events, also works for adults. I, you know, in the lecture, I kind of explain why uh, the paper balls over the head is a terrible trick to do for people. It's a horrible trick. Mm. And, I, and I leave it at that. So again, there's the psychology of it. There's the performance of it. So yeah, you know, I'm available for lectures in person. I've done a couple of Zoom lectures but I am so looking forward to, you know, traveling around England or, or going to foreign countries. Uh, can't wait to get back to America. Um, and just, you know, just uh, doing my lecture for people, meeting new people, helping magicians, meeting friends, you know, previous friends, new friends, people I only want to be on Facebook friends, <laughs> all, you know, all, yeah. all sorts. So, yeah. Um, how they can contact me, as we've said, it will appear. It will appear down here somewhere. Yes, it will. So please book my lecture. I'm not as busy as Craig thinks I am. <laughs> there you go. That's the best sales pitch. Yeah, this, don't you? You know, you know they, they have the, the busiest magician in the world. And you go, well, he has no time to do my event then. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it, you know. Absolutely. You know what? You've mentioned a few times Destination Box. It'd be remiss for me not to bring this up because I featured it on a video of the best closers of all time. And, and it is. I use it. It's probably my main. I, I love love that trick. And I have had so many people say to me, I'm trying to get one. It's not available. John says it's not available. Um, yeah. Why did you include it? If it's not available. Is there maybe at some point down the line, and I know because I own two destination boxes because I never want to accidentally spare. lose them. Always I've, buy a spare. I have got a spare. When I realized how important that was going to be in my act, I've got a spare one. And because uh, if you remember about three years ago, I lost the little silver pill boxes. Yeah. And I, I, I contacted you and I said, please, John, please. And yeah. if you remember at the time, I said, actually, don't send me X amount, send me triple the amount because then yeah. this is never going to happen again. Um, so are you ever planning on bringing this out again? Because for me, it is the final answer when it comes to any object, not just card, any object to impossible location. For me, this yeah. is the most commercial, most practical method that there is out yeah. there. We, we, we do say any object. I mean, you cannot vanish an airplane and yeah. have it appear in a little silver box. So if it fits inside, it will, it can it's appear good. in there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Again, before the pandemic, I was looking into getting the boxes made again. It is one of those items. I didn't want it to be cheap. I wanted it to be well made. You know, there, there are, uh, you know, that certain things mass produce that, that that's fine. But then there's also a certain level of props where it should only be high quality. And I wanted the destination box to be only high quality. Uh, it did get too expensive to, to manufacture, uh, especially because of uh, volume as well. So I, I have been looking to get it uh, made again. Um, so it's baby steps, but maybe next year. I'm not sure if Blackpool is, uh, is realistic. But yeah, I, I definitely want to, to do the destination box uh, once again, because 
again, I would always uh, use it pretty much every single table. I know, again, earlier we spoke about doing the same trick over and over again. I just love the reactions that it gets. But also, like I said before with the props, I would use this box for helping me in my presentation and, and my set. And I know you've spoken before about top and tailing. Yeah. So I would hand out this box at the beginning. The reason I can hand it out is it's actually padlocked, as you know. And just, a, just as a side, I've looked over to someone, I have genuinely seen them with a fork trying to prise open the hinge. <laughs> so he's there with a hinge trying to open it. I'm like, you know, I said about corporate and children, there's not that much difference. Mm -hmm. So I just took it off of him. I didn't say anything, just took it off of him, handed it to someone else. So yeah, I start with it. There we go. And then I say, you know, as a finale, you've been looking after the box. It was, it was you, but you're an idiot. So it's now you. And so they know that things are coming full circle. Again, a bit like the silent treatment, but it's just nice when you can finish with something that you started with. Yes. I know that there, there are people, there will be people that go, um, you, you can't, you can't top card on ceiling or brainwave or bottle through table, whatever you, that, that's, that's just a, a closer. You can't do anything else after it. And I go do something else, mm -hmm. you know, card on ceiling. Okay. Do I, I can't think of another, you know, do sponge balls, mm -hmm. do another trick. They don't know that's the, that's the, the closing trick just because you think it's fantastic. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, we do this for people and oh my God, that's in incredible. Yeah. And yet the thing that you've been rehearsing for months and months, they go, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're just doing a sequence of tricks, it's a sequence of tricks, but the destination box is not just a trick. It's not just a prop for a trick. It's essential to the routining of the entire set. I so I, I do, and I do that with Paragon 3D now. If I can, if I can get a destination box back on again, then you know that will definitely be something that I'll, I'll be talking about, rather than just here's the prop, here's the moves, go off and do it. And the other nice thing about the destination box, of course, is you talk about doing the same trick at table to table to table. You can vary it up each table. First table, make a card disappear. Second table, make a ring disappear. Third table, money. Fourth table, have an impossible prediction and treat it like a yep. closer version of the master prediction system or something like that. It's Yeah. I mean, I've had someone say, can you do a trick with this? And it was their earring. And I've gone, yep, sure. Just let me drop your earring in here. It's vanished and it appears in the box that they're holding. Uh, I was told to go over to a table when I was doing restaurants because it was a birthday and it turned out it was a double birthday. So I had two people choose a card and two cards appeared inside. Oh, great. Which you can't do with other cards or boxes. No. Um, so I had double, I've done it with a chain as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's the, the versatility is, is one thing. Um, but as I said, for me, it, it's, it's what it can do as well away from it's more than just the trick itself. Yeah. Completely. And I think a lot of magic, it's not just the destination box. There's a lot of magic. I, I mentioned double back, you know, I know I'm mentioning my product, but why not? I, I have faith in you. <laughs> but, you know, double back. It's, it's not a packet trick. It's a way to start a, um, it's a way to start a card routine. You know, come on, Mr. Magician, show us a trick. I had this at a Christmas party. It was an army barracks. Hey, come on, Mr. Magic, show us some tricks then in that condescending way that they do. And I said, okay, so I, I do double back. I get to the, the finale and they're literally like, and I say, I call that the don't F with me trick. <laughs> and I just carried on, you know. So, I, I try and find things, you know, I try and make certain tricks bigger than just the trick itself. That's great. That's great. I want to go and watch your lecture again. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. And what a, um, 
what a brilliant way to end this interview. I mean, this has been an incredible interview. I've been wanting to get you on the channel for a long time. And uh, I, I had high hopes that this, this would be an amazing interview. You did not disappoint. This has been uh, one of my favorite interviews that I've done on this channel. Uh, genuinely, it's been amazing. Thank you. Well, you know, it, it took a pandemic, but we got there. We got there in the end, absolutely. And, and you know what? It's kind of that whole thing. What does it make possible? Uh, I, if, if it wasn't for the pandemic, I wouldn't be doing this YouTube channel right now. Uh, yeah. Doing this interview, yeah. So. And now, now my turn back to you to say that, you know, I, I've seen some of your other interviews and I know that, you know, people have appreciated, uh, you know, the, the, the questions that you ask and you do uh, deep dives in, into people rather than just the superficial stuff that, you know, most people get asked. Um, and it's 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 great, you know. Um, so yeah, so f thank you for for doing them. Thank you, John. That means a lot. It really does. Because, like I said, John Allen fanboy right here. So <laughs> it's 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 great. I love you to bits. Um, please do me a favor, guys. Leave a comment down below for John because I'm sure he will see it. And and do me a favor and support this man. He has an online shop. And all of his products are incredible. Go and check it out. And, uh, you know, if you want my opinion, he's mentioned it a few times. Start with Double Backed. Uh, the um, the see-through mystery box is absolutely oh! Paragon 3D, Paragon, please. Paragon, oh! Paragon. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh. <laughs> and obviously, Silent Treatment is... Uh, is it, I would start with those three. Um, silent Treatment's been my opener in my parlor show for as long back as I can remember. So yeah, uh, please continue to create, please continue to bring magic out. Um, well, I was thinking of retiring, but seeing as you asked. Good, no, don't. Just for you. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> the magic community needs you, they really do. Thank you. It's true. Guys, like I said, leave a comment down below. Uh, nice comment, not a horrible comment, just nice comments. Yeah, well, people know what I think about nasty comments on this channel. Yes, nice comments only. <laughs> And, um, and yeah, I'll, I'll be back again tomorrow with another video. So I will catch you tomorrow. John, thank you very much. You are no, my pleasure. Thanks. You too. Take care. Guys, I just wanted to add one thing at the end of this video. I wanted to say thank you so much for John Allen for coming on the channel. I've always respected John as a magician, as a creator, and uh, he's one of the good guys in magic. And it was absolutely wonderful having him on the channel. I am a John Allen fanboy. Uh, I just want to say that I'm going to be doing a John Allen review show special at some point in the future. But when me and John spoke on the interview, we talked about a product that he bought out in lockdown that takes a 50-50 choice and uh, turns it on its head. I have now seen that product and I will be talking about it in the review show special for John. But one thing that I want to say is that is amazing. Having now seen what he's done and how it works and what this whole principle is capable of, it's incredible. I mean, it's incredible. It takes a 50-50 proposition and takes it to an entire other level. He's right, you can't really kind of do a performance. I can't really explain why it's so good. But trust me, if you wanna get something, if you do a 50-50 in your show, maybe it's Decisions by Mosaic, maybe it's Swindle, by Steve Cook, I don't know, maybe it's just a witch hand routine. If you do a 50-50 in your show, and, and, and by the way, on the download, uh, John goes through a 50-50, which is brilliant, it's absolutely great. Um, but if you do a 50-50, or you like the idea of doing a 50-50, I promise you, listening to this principle by John will absolutely make that routine a million times better. So there you go, this isn't a review, this is the end of the interview, but I just wanted to reference that because we talked about it in the interview. I just wanted to reference, I've now looked at it and I completely agree with everything that John said. I will be doing a review show special on John at some point in the future, so look out for that. But guys, once again, thank you very much for checking out the latest Talk Magic. I really appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment down below, and I'm going to be back again tomorrow with another Magic Live and uh, another video. So I'll see you there.